Okay, uh, so this book is called The Zen Teachings of Huang Po on the Transmission of Mind. Um, I found it really interesting because the reality is I hadn't thought about Zen past uh, a lot of my understanding of it as a Hollywood depiction. <laughs> I have, I'm used to seeing it like kind of in... Uh, conjunction with cartoons making a pass at like feng shui, they kind of like combine those ideas usually. What's feng shui? Feng shui is the. I'm gonna summarize it in a really poor way, but effectively it is the belief of like how your environment's energy can affect the people who come through it. And so, like, the way you arrange a room, the intent you put into it can change the energy of the space. That is one aspect of it. I think there's a lot more to it, but that's the, um, that's the, uh, oh, I think I, I that's think the dime store that. version, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> yeah, so, um, cool. this text starts out, as you can probably see if you're doing any reading. If not, don't worry about it. Um, talking about Huang Po and um, the doc and how the doctrine of Zen uh, claims to stem from Gautama Buddha's teachings. Um, it is. I'm trying to think. Oh, so it doesn't get super. <laughs> the introduction doesn't get super interesting for like another few paragraphs, in my opinion. Uh, but it's worth kind of skimming over it of the. Um, that Zen has its closest relation to the Mahayana school. Okay. And that, but it is distinctly very different from like v Vajrayana or um, a couple of the other schools. If you're if you're into that knowledge, <laughs> I um. I'm always down for knowledge. Yeah, good Ravenclaw. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually a Hufflepuff. <gasps> I'm a Hufflepuff. <laughs> Yay! Um, so... Just the starting trailer. Um, so, Huang Po and his followers were concerned solely with the direct perception of truth, which I vibe with a lot, um, given my own personal pursuits and my personal... Uh, I have a lot of strong emotions that come up when people aren't clearly communicating ideas. And so that um, perception of truth is a meaningful thought to me. Now, at any moment, obviously, and you've been doing great, uh, but interrupt me. If I sound like I'm lecturing, just stop me. I oh. <laughs> I, uh, I tend to babble until I am given a reason not to. Um, so, da, 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 we're going to skip a little bit. And we're going to talk about... Uh, so, this is where it got really interesting. If the... So, this is where the author touches on the idea of the Buddha's enlightenment beneath the bow tree. And um, the intensity of it is in its utter completeness um otherwise that the um let's see in his more nearly something about clearly describing the same experience as theirs so like that all enlightenment is the same but there are different varying levels of intensity otherwise mm -hmm. one would have to assume several forms of absolute truth which is kind of paradoxical um <laughs> or else one would be driven to believe that some or all of the masters were lost in clouds of self-deception. I like that sentence. Hi, what's the book? That one. Um, I had it in my clipboard, so I just what's pasted it. What's the bow tree? Uh, the bow tree is a particular type of tree. Its nuts are round and it's, like lumpy. Um, other than that, I don't know a lot about the bow tree. But I do know that it is to the famous tree where, like, Buddha sat under long enough to become enlightened. 
like I'm not related to sitting under the tree. That's just where he sat, I think. Unless I'm wrong, which is totally possible. Alright. <laughs> uh, bye, G. Bye, G. Bye, G. <laughs> Um, and then, <laughs> um, Gautama Buddha is said to have modified the exposition of his doctrine to suit the different capacity of his various disciples and of those others who listen to his discourse. Um, I liked that this author doesn't seem to have anything like a super big agenda. Like there's, the writing is very plain into the, into the point. I feel like, I feel like I'm learning a lot of perspectives when I'm reading it. Um, the Buddha, <laughs> but then this is where I think it's uh comes into the Zen part. It's like I don't actually I haven't read this, but later the Buddha called this disciple to him in private and mystically transmitted to him the wordless doctrine, or oh, with the mind transmitted mind, in a word I can't pronounce. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so this is a bit of of uh, mythos that I actually haven't read much of and I, I, I suddenly feel the need to research um, so I can talk about it mo with Hi, more G. authority and is said to have helped create some of the first Chinese patriarchs blah 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 theories concerning the origin and development of the sect uh, so then we get a little more history which is cool I appreciated the history I am not clicked on to this book for some reason okay there we go. Um, so we get into some of the like I said, so it takes a little bit, but then you get into some interesting knowledge about Zen itself. Um, I didn't realize there was any kind of animosity between Zen and Buddhism. This is often the case where I'm not like aware that any kind of belief system is mad at another one. But apparently there is some spicy feelings between some followers of Buddhism and some Zen, but it, for the most part, uh, this author makes a good point, and I think I'd agree with them that uh, Zen sets does that Zen does not set itself in op opposition to Buddhism, and uh, it is Buddhism. Yeah, it is Buddhism. It's really interesting, and it is Buddhism for sure. But apparently, not... some people get spicy about it. <laughs> yeah. Is it like a secular thing? No. It's like from what I got from reading this text, the spicy comes from certain sects of Buddhism rather than the Zen yeah. like practitioners. Like, there there are some Buddhist traditions that look down on the Zen. Mm. Um, Zen's not unique I, in giving emphasis to, like, a particular aspect of the whole doctrine. Kind. Let's see. Yeah, it's not, is it? It's so weird. Like, I hear these things, I'm like, that's not very Buddhist of you. <laughs> like, <laughs> why are you doing that? <laughs> um, Buddhism has like... changed into very non-Buddhist things in different ways over the years. Uh, what I like about the way this author talks about it, though, is like, thus it is a form of Buddhism suited to those who prefer inward contemplation to the study of scriptures or to the performance of good works, which I vibe with. <laughs> I, don't, I don't personally study a lot of the scriptures. Um, but Zen's not unique in this way. Um, right meditation forms the final step of the Noble Eightfold Path. Oh, um... Captain, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, this is a part I was particularly interested in hearing your thought process on. Um, oh. Where, uh, so, it says, Okay, in his own teachings, a doctrine which refers that seven preceding steps of the Noble Eightfold Path are to be regarded as preparation for the eighth step. So, if, oh. so, like, um, if, if, it wasn't meant to be preparation for that eighth step. Like, they're the steps to that step. Why did we use path and steps? <laughs> and so, um, I thought that was really interesting hot take on the Eightfold Path. Um, and that comes from... What's the eighth step? Right. Samadhi. Meditation. Um, it's, it's like... It's like right meditation, but it's like the next level of it. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Oh. There's a lot of weird nuance to it. Um, I fully disagree. <laughs> for seven, our paths to the eight. Mm-hmm. Because, as per Zen, you start at the beginning of the circle. The eight fold path are spokes on a wheel. Where's the beginning of the wheel? Mm-hmm. It's the middle, which means it's all of it. So you don't start at one and then go to eight. You do all of them at the same time. They support each other. It's interdependent. Anyway, that's my take. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm writing something down. That's all right. Yeah, I'm so surprised. That's a, a Zen person said that seven lead to the eighth. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't think it was the author. Let's see. It does not seem to be especially in length of the movie. Uh, so it is, he's just talking about the doctrine itself of the Bodhi Hidharma. Bodhi Dharma. Bodhi Dharma. Bodhi Dharma. <laughs> Let me just say it with a weird <laughs> accent. Accent. Yeah, it just makes everything better. Um,. I'm talking a bit more about another teacher. The ground in China had been well prepared for Zin. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Quietism prepared the Chinese mind for reception of the doctrine. In many ways, strikingly similar to their own. It's true. So, uh, centuries of Confucianism, the author's claiming, primed the Chinese people. Con con yeah, Confucianism, you're right. What did I say? You said it right, but I heard it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, the author is stating that uh, centuries of Confucianism had predisposed the, the people of China to for Zen, as it was strikingly similar for them in a lot of ways. Which, if you've read any of Confucianism, that almost sounds weird to me, because it's, but it's been a while since I read the... This is the second thing they've said that strikes me as weird. Yeah. Okay, so, Confucianism, in a way, does set the groundwork for Zen, because it's very big on uh, rituals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a, a social code, and having, having rules. All of those things. Mm -hmm. That's very Confucian. Um, but the the ideology, rather than the practice, was laid down by Taoism. Mm -hmm. So, I'm, I'm going to keep giving this author a chance, but I'm becoming curious as to their real position here. It's, it's interesting. Um... Oh god, I almost spilt my coffee everywhere. <laughs> I got coffee too. It's literally 12 30 for me, but whatever. Um, the author does say so it may be that the historical authenticity of Zen is of relatively little importance, uh, except to a limited number of scholars. Um, the historical accuracy? No, no authenticity. authenticity. Oh. It's, a, it's a little different of a approach. I do think that having a knowledge of the history of Zen in terms of how it progressed and what it started with and where it is now greatly informs one's practice beyond just having a historical idea of the factual events. I think that can be important for just about anything, but I can. Right. But to the same degree, I can also I have a dual mind about it, right? Like, I think learning all the history and how things have changed and more from where those ideas have originally came from is really interesting and cool and important to a deep understanding but at the same time in this regard <laughs> in particular with Zen you don't need it mm -hmm. you absolutely don't because it can become a distraction Zen is very much uh, illustration on the job mm -hmm. sort of sort of thing rather than you know go do these studies <laughs> on the job training <laughs> Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, uh, the author claims that Westerners' familiarity might be coming from Dr. Daisette's Tairo Suzuki, 
and oh, hold on, hold on. What, highlight this for me. <laughs> uh, 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 illuminating work. This oh, one. Dice at Suzuki. Suzuki. Um, DT Suzuki. DT Suzuki. I can do that one. All right, so Doctor um, DT Suzuki. Suzuki was actually the inspiration for Yoda. Ah. Mhm. Mm That's cool. Um, Did he, he was backwards? very big. What? <laughs> no, well, no. Um, that's just an affectation. But Yoda's likeness, Yoda's um, mentality, mm -hmm. was very, very heavily influenced by Zen. Mm -hmm. Not the likeness. That was DT Suzuki. But Zen mentality. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And DT Suzuki came out with a lovely book. I forget what it's called. I think it might just be called The Buddha. Um, but very, very uh, well known about 50 years ago mm -hmm. uh, and was in large part responsible alongside Alan Watts for bringing Zen to the West. Mm -hmm. Ah, That's Alan Watts. <laughs> ah, Alan Watts. <laughs> If he's anything like yoga, he deserves all the hugs. Uh, sure. <laughs> we, we all, we all well, deserve hugs. We all deserve hugs. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Uh, um. <laughs> so, the author gets to an interesting point where he then goes on to say, talk about the people's perception of the very paradoxical like way of zen of things seem very contrary to each other um zen followers go further they are not content to pursue enlightenment through ions of varied existences inevitably bound up with pain and ignorance <laughs> slowness the supreme experience which christian mid mystics have described as union with the godhead they believe huh? of your reading is fucking great. Christians? So yeah, so this is where the author like threw me for a loop. I did not expect them to go in this direction, but they start talking about the Christian mystics for a few so paragraphs. This, this is an interesting. There are no mystics. Oh, there are. Yeah, there's Christian mysticism. Really? Yeah, there are mystics in the Christian oh, yeah. faith. Uh, but they are. But so I don't know how fa if you're really familiar with the Christian drama. There are so many denominations. <laughs> it's wild. What even is that? What mystic. is a denomin? What is a mystic? Oh my gosh! So it just. Mm -hmm. mm, let me think of how to boil it down. Um, Give me a moment, and I will be able to get back onto the mic and going inside. Okay. Mm, <laughs> so Christian mystics. Hmm. Okay. Imagine a shaman. Christian. Mm-hmm. And not ghosts. <laughs> like Native American shaman or um indigenous shaman like wow. Close, closer to Oh well, like a mix of both. <laughs> Alright, so uh Wikipedia defines Christian practices and theory of within Christian Christianity. It's not a, really a doctrine so much as a way of thought. Uh, Christian mysticism talks about initiating the mystic or like really. Um, <sighs> so it talks about like preparation and the consciousness of God and really like combining with God and this. <sighs> All right. I'm just thinking about like so that like one um super. Satan move where like they put their hands together and they somehow formed the spirit ball in Dragon Ball Z. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, wow. Dragon Ball Z, that one. <laughs> um, Christian mysticism. So, are you familiar with like uh, Franciscan monks, for example? No. <laughs> okay. That I'm an be... idiot. No, 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 no. <laughs> Very few people, other than religious nerds like me, actually know what the hell a Franciscan monk is. Um, 
they're they're they would be qualified as Christian mystics. They spend a lot of their time, rather than in meditation, in prayer. But it's remarkably similar in effect, um, and the Christian ideology is concerned with reuniting with God because we were uh, separated in the fall when Adam and Eve ate the apple, etc., whatever. So our, our whole point is to reunite and undo this original sin. Jesus came along to try and bridge that gap. Um, but before Jesus, and even after Jesus, there have been more direct means than using Jesus as a middleman. So some mystics enter a state of Hmm. Well, yeah, we'll say we'll say meditation, um, and they experience things symptomatically quite similar to enlightenment, except they've got an entirely different context informing what that means. All right. Mm -hmm. When you were saying fusion, using, I I just thought of this image. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Excellent. <laughs> Sweet Buddhist Excellent. fusion dance. Yes. <laughs> fusion, ha! <laughs> uh, so, where are we at? Dun, I don't know, da, 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 da. Oh yeah, we're going into the Christian mysticism. Uh, I got lost <laughs> in your words. It did. I should have taken the cup. So, regard... God is the uncaused and unbegat, which logically implies perfection, and talks a bit about good and evil, or God is both good and evil, so, um... <coughs> this is... If valid places God on a lower level than perfection, for there can be neither unity nor wholeness, where A excludes B, or B excludes A. thought that was a really just interesting, random paragraph. To I feel like they just slapped down it Christianity in. Mm -hmm. in like a very polite way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Zen followers do not use the term God, being wary of its dualistic and anthropomorphic implications. They prefer to talk of the absolute or the one mind. That is a very wise, very wise move. Mm -hmm. So much baggage with God. Mm -hmm. Well, beyond difficulty that it will present obstacles in psychologically. There's too much uh, cultural baggage, even. Yeah. Like, especially here, I don't know about other cultures, but definitely here in the U.S. <laughs> Be beyond yeah, theological thought... difficulties, there's just, social... Just social and, cred yeah, going on. His historical mm -hmm. stuff that you just really, that's a, that's a messy thing. Yeah, they made a good move there. I thought this was interesting. I hadn't really thought about it or realize it, but furthermore, Zen followers hold that the absolute or union with the absolute is not something to be attained. One does not enter nirvana. Nirvana for entrance to a place one has never left is pos impossible. What does that mean? That is something I don't know. <laughs> but I thought about it. That was interesting. Hold on. Hold on. Where is this on Over the here. page? Did you highlight? I just highlighted it's on the left. It's oh, it got fuzzy. Damn it. <laughs> Why is it fuzzy? Oh, there we go. It just takes a second. It's a load sometimes. <clears throat> the experience oh. commonly called entering nirvana is, in fact, an intuitive realization of the self-nature, which is the true nature of all things, okay, the actual reality. <laughs> so it's like saying, it's not correct to say you've lost your glasses if you're still wearing them and don't know that they're on there. Mm -hmm. In the same way, you can't attain nirvana because you just forgot you're already there. Mm -hmm. So this is more of a recognizing than an attaining. Mm -hmm. That makes, makes sense. sense. 
Um, I highlighted another sentence earlier, I guess, and I liked it. I am the absolute, except that I am no longer I. What I behold then is my real self which is the true nature of all things. Seer and seen are one and the same, yet there is no seeing, just as the eye cannot behold itself. I love that analogy so much. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. I've heard, um, like, twists on the idea, but that, it, I mean, that I, I always enjoy that particular analogy. But just as a knife cannot cut itself, mm -hmm. just as the teeth cannot bite themselves, and just as fire cannot burn itself. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of the those. They're, they're great. Mm -hmm. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a compelling argument. But it's easily overlooked as being like, what the hell are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> Mood. Yeah. <laughs> um... If all is one, the knowledge of a being's true self-nature, his original self, is equally a knowledge of all nature, the nature of everything in the universe. Those who have actually achieved this tremendous experience, whether it's Christians, Buddhists, or members of other faiths, are agreed as to the impossibility of communicating it in words. Yep. Now this, let me just pause you real quick. This has been blown out of context in so many ideas, mm -hmm. in so many traditions, because they're saying, oh, yes, you reach enlightenment, and then you know everything. You become <laughs> omniscient. No. And no. That's not at all what this is. It's saying you gain insight into the nature of everything. Mm -hmm. The nature being the key part of that phrase. Mm -hmm. You don't know how many atoms something has just because you recognize that you aren't a single individual, but you are all of reality. That doesn't tell you everything about everything. It just tells you how everything is interconnected, how everything flows, and how it is a mistake to say, this is me, that is not me. Mm -hmm. So, like, you get a good groundwork for how things interrelate, for how this all plays with itself. But you don't suddenly know the population of Indonesia just because you figured out that you aren't who you think you are. Mm -hmm. And this wording, I think, not only here, but in many places, is responsible for this mm -hmm. misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen uh, very religious students saying, I can't be enlightened yet. I don't know everything. I don't know everything. I'm just like, oh, you sure don't. Oh. <laughs> I mean, you never will. That's the thing. Right. You will never know everything. The goal of Buddhism is I dare, I dare you. It's the dissolution of, of the, the ego. And, mm -hmm. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I dare you to cram every fact of the universe into your inside your tiny skull right. and being able to function in everyday life. You'll Just be like that horse like, in The Bravest like, Warriors. I was, I was thinking more of uh, the, the fourth Indiana Jones movie. Mm. I love Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones oh, yeah, loves you, too. Oh, yeah, that one scene. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Aw. Thank you. Get you. Um, so, tremendous experience, blah, 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 blah. Let's go to the next page. Bam. Yay. Um, I will now be clear that Zen masters do not employ paradoxes from a love of cheap mystis mystification. They do, Although I sure would. Though they do occasionally <laughs> make humorous use of them Who when would? humor seems needed. <laughs> that is like such everyone. A a subtle way of saying, yeah, these guys are nuts. <laughs> they are nuts. <laughs> um, uh, po criticized Buddhists who followed a more conventional path. Um, such are not intended to call into question the value of humanity. Uh, I'm not like other Buddhists. <laughs> <laughs> 
Everybody was concerned less concepts such as virtue should lead people into dualism and lest they should hold enlightenment to be a gradual process attainable by other means than intuitive insight. Got a lot of words going on here. A lot. Yes. A lot of it's words. It's like it's a book or something. I know. Weird. Mm -hmm. It's just a wall of text I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> so story. at this stage I've read this introduction three times <laughs> and um, I have to tell you a lot of it is still just kind of gibberish to me <laughs> I haven't read it at all but I'll help you translate <laughs> Um, That's me whenever I'm reading the Bible and just over here like, what? what? <laughs> oh, the Bible's such a fucking slog. <laughs> it is. Like, whenever we introduce a character, we must know it, their entire lineage. Oh, God. Starting all the way from Adam. Man, there no. are modern writers who like, like, write like that, though. <laughs> like, for real. I've had to chuck books because I couldn't do it. <laughs> Why? Just put it in the burn pile. Mm -hmm. Oh, Adam. <laughs> Do you remember when Jesus was introduced? And held water. Um, that was the ghost of dead authors you've criticized trying to kill you. Yes. <laughs> Moses is trying to strangle you. That would be great. <laughs> Help, I'm being possessed by Moses. <laughs> I'm being possessed by Moses. Um... <laughs> So the book tells us very little about the practice of what, for want of a better translation, is often called meditation or contemplation. So this book doesn't super really go like, this is how you meditate. <laughs> this is what it's like. <laughs> um, the Buddha himself gives very little instructions on how to meditate other than what it is not, says the author. That's a very, a very common thing for Zen. They won't tell you what something is. But they'll tell you what it isn't, and mm -hmm. you have to figure it out. Yeah. That's not confusing at all. Well, there's a certain logic to this. Because um, if you tell someone that, say, this apple is not a dog, they will say, well, certainly it isn't. But then they'll, if you don't say this apple, if you say, and holding an apple, if you just say, this is not a dog, that is such a bizarre thing to say to someone, <laughs> and so, so obvious, that it does give you a second of pause, being like, well then what is it? <laughs> well, because is the, it? the immediate idea is, oh, it's obviously an apple, but you're not actually looking at it, are you? You're just throwing the label apple onto it and saying that's what it is. Mm -hmm. By saying, this isn't a dog, and holding an apple up to your face, you actually take a look at it for just a second to make sure it's not a dog. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, it's that. <laughs> and because it wasn't named, there's some pause in you giving it that label. Mm -hmm. And this, this practice is all about fostering that kind of mentality. So they're not even going to tell you, don't attach labels to things. They'll just force you not to. Mm-hmm. You, nice. you only thought you'd get a label. <laughs> <laughs> you thought. <laughs> ha, you thought. Ha ha. Um. <laughs> so um, he does say the author says something about the translation, pointing out that a meditation is not about being super blank stone lump of clay or stone. Rather, you cultivate a dispassion, realizing that none of the attractive or unattractive attributes of things have any absolute existence. It's not a not a bad point. <laughs> um, this is where it gets interesting, where my brain's like, "All right, I'm listening, I guess," and it's like, "There can be no gradual, no partial enlightenment. The highly trained and zealous adept." may be said to have prepared himself for enlightenment, but by no means can he be regarded as partially enlightened. Just as a drop of water may get hotter and hotter than, and then suddenly boil, at no stage is it partially boiling. 
And until the very not, moment of boiling, no qualitative change has occurred. There are differences in temperature within the water. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I know what they mean. <laughs> yeah. Well, tried. There's still quality difference. <laughs> there does, in fact, become a line where I can either drink the water or not. <laughs> <laughs> or you can just distill it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. Catch it. Or just drink straight salt water. Oh, oh, they're gonna talk about the the rivers and the mountains not being rivers and mountains. This is great. Yeah, all is huh? the one mind. There's okay. Let me preface this. There's an there's an old Zen saying that uh, one of I forget who it was, but one of the masters said, "Before I was enlightened, mountains were mountains and rivers were rivers." While I was pursuing enlightenment, mountains were not mountains, and rivers were not rivers. After enlightenment, mountains were mountains, and rivers were rivers. <laughs> yeah. That's a setup for the next part, Des. <laughs> Spike it, I gave it to you. Spike it. <laughs> To the great majority of people, the moon is the moon and the trees are trees. It is to perceive that the, the next stage is to perceive that moon and trees are not at all what they seem to be, since all is the one mind. <laughs> when this stage is achieved, we have the concept of a vast uniformity in which all the distinctions are void. And to some adepts, this concept may come as an actual perception, as quote unquote real it said that when enlightenment really comes the moon again very much the moon and the trees exactly trees but with a difference for the enlightened man is capable of perceiving both unity and multiplicity <laughs> no contradictions so, so that last part with with without the least contradiction between them mm -hmm. um that ability to hold two dissonant understandings without having them be mutually exclusive is indeed a hallmark of the enlightened mind. Because um, before I got into any of this Buddhism stuff, things are clearly distinct. They have their own qualities. There are limits in terms of the physical, you know, being and all of this. Um... But it's like looking at the image, or it's like looking at the um, the painting without looking at the canvas. Y you don't see that undergirding, sustaining bit which connects it all. You just look at the things. You know, you look at the the drink and you don't look at the cup kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. And with enlightenment you suddenly become aware of the background of the substrate of the universe and it is entirely visible it's not something that you can just you know oh well i think it's like this no it's there right in front of you it's obvious as day and that's such a stark contrast to essentially just not even thinking to look at it beforehand so that you can have these uh, contradictory notions of this tree and that dog are different. Mm -hmm. But then you go and watch the dog pee on the tree and you say, ah, oh, no, they're not. And it's true both ways. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't actually have a point. <laughs> no. That's good. So, like, we're supposed to notice that everything's connected? Mm hmm Not so much are they supposed to. Um, but, yes, that is one of the goals, because you start to... Um, essentially, you start to build new neural pathways in your mind that let you look at things in unconventional ways. And this, this novelty of your framing <clears throat> um, can unlock 
insights. It can show you, yeah, how these things are all related in ways that aren't obvious on the surface, but are very obvious if you just just look at it for a bit. I mean, like with the moon. The moon controls the tide to help the water, so no water goes to the ocean. I don't know. Right. So that's a direct observation of how the moon and the water are interrelated. They are, in a way, one thing. And if you look at this as an extension, just look at gravity as a whole. Everything affects everything else through gravitational uh, pull. Now, what's happening on the other side of the universe doesn't necessarily change things much here, but we still do feel it's gravity, so it is technically connected. This is a physics version of what Buddhism is pointing at. The, the Buddhist version is a little, um, a little more substantial, but that's, that's the way to it. Huh? Spiritual? Substantial. It, it can be spiritual. Um, mm -hmm. It certainly feels spiritual when you, when you have that moment of aha, but uh, I'm a secular Buddhist, for example, so I found it to be spiritual without the whole, um, you know, I see into the different realms or <laughs> the, the Buddhas and the, the uh, Bodhisattvas are speaking to me and clearing my mind. Like, it, it, it depends a lot on, on how you are coming into it and what context you're using to define your experience. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. It's good stuff, though. I recommend it. It's a lot. <laughs> it, is, it is a lot. The author goes on to talk yeah. about the book and that they do take other forms of Buddhism seriously. Um, and just discussing <laughs> Huang Po's like, feelings about stuff. Um, but then... I liked this sentence, which was, Moreover, when the time has come for a Buddhist to discipline his mind so as to rise above duality, he enters a stage where the notions of both good and evil must be transcended like any other form of dualism. Oh, yeah. I thought that was a nice little piece of... We've run into quite a few issues with this very subject mm -hmm. in, the, in the Sangha, because there will be people that are new to the, the practice, um come in and they'll have heard about this, about how there is no good or evil, and be like, what do you mean? It's so obvious that there are things that are good and evil, but... It's really up with... to you, honestly. Your perspective, right. you can't just say that. Those things are highly subjective. What's good to you might be evil to me. Mm -hmm. So to say that this is an objective truth is a misunderstanding. Um, but it's so culturally ingrained in us that very few ever think to even question this dualistic good and evil sort of mm -hmm. back and forth. Yes. I, I, mean, I think that's the, fascinating. The first way to understanding is seeing how the other person sees what they're doing is right when really they might be wrong in your eyes. Yeah. Even if you disagree with someone, understanding why they're saying it goes miles towards reconciliation and working together. I mean, I've often had times with some ex-friends where it's just like, they refuse to work with me, so I had to just kind of stop. If that's, that's making fair. sense. Yeah. I mean, why why expend energy on someone who's just not going to value your time? It's just like, I feel bad for doing it, but at the same time, like, I'm not their mother. Oh, yeah. Job. Don't feel bad about that. You're, you're doing what's good for you. Ha ha, good. Ha ha ha. Ha ha. Oh ho! That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, a lot of people fall into the common error of performing good works with a conscious desire to store up merit for themselves. I think this is true in like every form of practice or religion. Yeah. A lot of people fall into this. Um, yeah. This is addressed in both Buddhism and Christianity. Mm -hmm. And both of them say you cannot... Well, Christianity says you do not get into the heaven by good works. And Buddhism says you don't get enlightened through merit. Mm -hmm. It's the same sentence. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's not to say that good works and you know, attaining merit are things to shun or be avoided. It's just saying, do those as an end to themselves rather than as a means to something else. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I keep hijacking your lecture. No, it's not a lecture, it's a discussion. Not, it's a lecture <laughs> for me. No, why? <laughs> I'll give a lecture. No, no, no. I'm doing the lecturing, you see. <laughs> yes, Buddha is... And I'm just over here. Captain over here is very good at the lecturing. I can be good at the lecturing if I knew more about what I was talking about. As it is, I'm pretending to know what I talk about. You pretend beautifully, dear. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> I didn't think you were pretending. <laughs> I'm pretending so That's good, I've already you tricked are. you. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Because Everything's so going according to plan. Uh <laughs> <laughs> um, so really the author spends a lot of time in the previous section talking about like Huang Po who is the author of the untranslated version of this book um, you know the, I think that's something to take into caveat anytime you're reading a book like this it has been translated and with that there's been some amount of interpretation um, like it's impossible to avoid uh, so a lot of authors and translators get really close, obviously, because they spend a lot of time trying to eradicate their own understanding. But every book you read that's been translated has an amount of opinion put into it. Um, we we keep going back to Christianity. I think Christianity is a great uh, example of this. I don't know about you guys. I'm also a theology nerd. But I started my theology nerdism in Christianity, so I spent a lot of time reading so many different versions of the text. <laughs> um, oh, you poor soul. <laughs> uh, well, I was fascinated about interpretation, right? Because in frequently in cultures that are non-English speaking, <laughs> the words they use can frequently be interpreted based on context or usage rather than just the word itself. And so, especially like God, God um, I suppose, would be an okay. So that's a whole other conversation in my brain. Um, there are just words that can be interpreted differently or and have been interpreted weirdly oftentimes. Um, so I won't bring any ones up in particular because I'm not here to cause a spicy debate. But um, they just they just can be interpreted differently depending on the translator. And they just mean something culturally different than has been interpreted. So there's a level of convenience of interpretation that often happens, especially in the early translations of the Christian texts. Um, anyway, that's a whole other conversation. That is to say, I would I always say take any book that's been translated with a grain of salt. <laughs> Even though as the author that's, here yeah. in his introduction explains like reasoning and gives us all this background knowledge of the original author um i think there's an impossibility to avoid some amount of their own ideas leaking into the translation of words and ideas and sometimes stuff just gets thrown out <laughs> like the apocrypha sometimes yeah um so we have the author talking about the sermons that huang po gave um, and then getting into the translation itself and how indebted they are to the Buddhist dictionary. And then we get into the super short little preface, which is the last bit of what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> the preface is before the face. 
Exactly. Uh, we haven't even gotten to the preface. We've all been like, where is this person we're looking for? Now we've got the preface. And then next week we'll actually look at their face. <laughs> it's all very mystical. <laughs> the face of Bodhidharma. Yes. Do you? I'm Des. Why don't you know how to say Bodhidharma? This Bodhidharma? Is the wild Bodhidharma? Mage from the West. Come on. He took Zen into China. What are you doing? <laughs> figured it out after I read it a couple times. Look, Captain, this has been a lifelong issue of I frequently don't know how to pronounce words that I know the definition of because I've only ever read them. I've never heard them said out loud. <laughs> Eyelid tea, Des, come on. <laughs> the great mess, Zen Master! <laughs> words lived below the vulture peak on Mountain Wangpo. You said vulture, and I heard bullshit. Yeah, bullshit peak. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, it cannot be communicated in words. The highest vehicle. So then we get into the vehicle stuff. So yes. This is like a book that needs a lot of pre-reading, in my opinion, to understand a lot of stuff. <laughs> Buddhism has that problem of entrenched terminology where they're just like, oh, everyone knows what I mean by this. Let's just use that. Yeah. So it's like the highest vehicle, which cannot be communicated in words. And I'm like, it took me a hot minute when I was reading this the first time to be like, what is the vehicles? What vehicles? Like a car? <laughs> Obviously, I didn't think it was a car, but it took me like, I had to Google it to remind myself. <laughs> It's not that I haven't heard them, but I don't just talk to people in my everyday language using that terminology. I mean, I do. Yeah, but oh, you're a nerd. I do, it, I do it less these days. <laughs> you're a total nerd, though. So, I am like... a nerd. <laughs> it's true. It's okay. Nerds are cool. That's why I married one. It really is. You, you certainly did. <laughs> you like my nerd and you know it. <laughs> um... Those who speak of it do not attempt to explain it. That's a bullshit statement. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, and then we get a little more history about Hui Shang. Chang. Chong. Chong. Just, just keep going. <laughs> about their time in the monastery and uh, this author studied under some people that were directly connected to this person who was connected to this person and so that's why we're supposed to think the author is super legit awesome time um yeah. and the transmission of the doctrine um we lost to future generations a lot of stuff i gave the manuscript to the monks requesting them to return to the Wang Tong monastery on the old mountain and to ask the elder monks where there, how far it agrees with what they themselves used frequently to hear in the past. So, basically, uh, the preface boils down to the author saying, look how legit I am. I know all these people who knew these people who knew these people back to Wang Po. Thus, I am like his great-grandson or something. <laughs> Lineage is spiritually um, so so unimportant, but don't tell them that. My boss at work would highly disagree with you. Uh, that knowing your spiritual lineage and where the formation of your base ideas uh, traveled across time and distance is really important. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. This is Zen, though. Yeah. They already talked about how the history really isn't important. So neither is lineage, y'all. Y'all. Yo. Come on. Yo. Hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. You've come here at the end. We're wrapping up now. Next well, week, we'll talk well, about point part one. I'm going to keep going. Des might have to run away, but I'm here. Yeah. One moment. I'm going to end the recording now. See y'all next week. Wait. What? <laughs>